Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to episode 19 of the Human Performance Outliers podcast, where we're going to bring in a very special guest, Gary Fetke. Before we get going, just one quick announcement. The HPO podcast is now live on Patreon. Sean and I have very much enjoyed recording these podcasts and we're learning a ton and hopefully you are too. If you've enjoyed the podcast and are in a position to maybe help out by donating a little bit, please consider checking out our Patreon page. Uh, Our goal is to continue to release a couple podcasts a week for free so that anyone who wants to hear the information can have uh, readily free access to it. But for our Patreon donors, we do have a few extra goodies, so please consider checking that out. The link is in the show notes, or you can just head to www.patreon.com backslash HPO podcast. Thanks again. Enjoy episode 19. Uh, Yeah, we're rolling. All right, and so I can so z- I can add yeah, or cut ahead. anything out. No, I, I didn't tell you where I've got my black tie this morning. <laughs> no, I didn't. I don't have a tie either, as you can see. Do you want to do you want to drop to this video audio only, Zach, for sound uh, quality or yeah, maybe we, maybe we should because it's showing up as uh, potentially a low connection for video. So let's just uh, disconnect video just to be safe. Okay, we've had a chance to admire each other's good looks now, and so we can we can just we'll just go to I'm, video. I can have I can have my cup in there without worrying. Yeah, you don't have to worry about that. Here. Okay, let's let's drop off the video and just go to audio, and then um, and we'll just chat. How's that sound? So uh, let me just Not so nice profile picture. What's that? Very classy, nice profile picture. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you've got look. So it looks like the bottom of a hip replacement. From what I look, I thought that was a f- ephemeral component. From what I was seeing there, I kind of looked at that. No, but, uh, it's come up as an image there. No, oh, nice. Well, um, what, do you, what do you guys want? How are you both, by the way? I mean, we're both on our all on our journeys and stuff. And yeah, well, I mean, Zach is training for his uh, hundred mile race here in the near future. You know, I'm doing just fine. You know, um, you know, it's it's it is it's kind of an interesting journey. Um, you know, I think, Gary, I think what's interesting, you know, because obviously you and I are both got orthopedic backgrounds. We're both doing orthopedics. And I think there's some specific stuff that, that I think a lot of people want to be will, will be interested in outside of the standard low carb stuff, because I think there's some unique stuff that you and I have probably discovered just about orthopedics in general and how the, how diet and nutrition impacts that specifically. And I think there's some specific stuff that might be of interest. And obviously you've been uh, went through your your battles and are still going through these battles over this absolutely easy, you know, you can't not to eat sugars i think is just I, you know I've, I've actually sought official uh understanding what i mean what the hell do you guys actually mean by this and the system actually can't answer it that's the fun thing and so i've i've continued to, i've actually got the national board under under charges at the moment and, well, um, you know, you think about it, and you know, when you when you put a patient in a hospital, you know, and you have inpatient, you do it, you know, you do a hip replacement or a knee replacement, or take somebody with a fracture. I mean, you know, your post op orders, one of the one of the standard orders is diet. <laughs> you got to put them on some kind of diet afterwards. And so, if they want to say you're not a physician is not allowed to to do any diet recommendations, I mean, how do you how do you supposed to order a post operative diet? Do you have to defer that to a to a licensed nutritionist to tell you what diet to put someone on post operatively? I mean, it's well, just insane to say doctors can't can't talk about diet. Absolutely, I'll, I'll actually argue that the standard Australian diet or you know American diet, well, particularly the hospital food diet, is actually uh, an immunosuppressant diet and, and highly inflammatory. It's the last thing I want my patients to have the moment they wake up. Yeah, I think that's that's that, that's absolutely true. You know, it's kind of funny because you know we know you know when you look at the the, the, the you know even the, the standard general surgery literature, they talk about nutritional status in wound healing, and we know clearly that good nutrition results in a better outcome for 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 patients. You know, even if we've already brought them to surgery with healing and, and, and reducing uh, complication rates, you know, having decent albumin status, and there's all kinds of nutritional markers we look at. But then our answer is, you know, I'm going to put them on a multivitamin. You know, that that was, you know, I kind of laughed when I when I when I think about it. And, and you know, in retrospect, you know, our our treatment for improving some of the nutritional status was put them on a multivitamin once a day, operatively. Well, my, my very radical management of um, non-healing wounds when they came in is. I uh, have to write it in the notes, but I want my patients to have two boiled eggs and a piece of cheese. <laughs> Great. And, and you can watch if those patients with you know chronic diabetic ulcers, you, you can start watching them heal. You know, with that radical management plan. 
and that and, and that's what I prescribe. You know, uh, you know, my God, I'm dangerous. Well, I you know I, I totally agree with you, Gary, and I, I think it's it's something that you know when I was. Uh, and, you know, I, like you, I under, I had to go through and, and it's still finishing up going through this silliness where I got, uh, you know, went after because of what I was doing. I was basically steering people away from aggressive surgeries in lieu of lifestyle interventions and less invasive stuff. And that and that, you know, I, I don't know on how in Australia is, but in, in the United States, orthopedics is very lucrative, not only for the surgeon, but it's very lucrative for the hospital. It is a very, you know. Uh, revenue generating uh, field and in the hospitals, you know, that's where they, that's where they make the money. That's how they, 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 they pay the light bills. That's how they, that's how they support to, themselves. Uh, uh, if you want to chat about this as we go along or is this, uh, what well, we I, think, I, I think we're kind of started already, Zach. I think we <laughs> informally start and we just kind of got off the cuff, but I mean, I think it's more natural that way, but yeah, but I mean that, you know, and I don't know if this, you know, in Australia, I know you have a little different system, but in, you know, in the, in the U.S., it's, it's, it's very much, you know, a lot of private pay, a lot of, you know, insurance. And so the things that generate a lot of money for a hospital are procedure heavy, procedure heavy fields like orthopedics, you know, interventional cardiology, some of these other ones where, where they just, you know, the, the, the oncology department, they're doing a lot of chemotherapy pursuits. Those things make a lot of money for hospitals. And so when you start to threaten that, I mean that 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 is something that that gets their attention, and you know, I, and I, I realized that very naively as I went through this, and, and in retrospect, I realized how naive I was, and you know, it, it's 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 turning out in the end it'll be okay for me, but it took me about three years of of, of really uh, disrupting my life, disrupting my family's life, a lot of stress, you know, as periods of time where I was you know, I was pretty damn depressed about all this stuff, and now. You know, ultimately, I've come through on the other side a happier person because now I, I kind of feel I feel that you know I've kind of realized what my passion is for helping people, and you know the the ultimate thing is to to you know fix the whole person, and and then you know the orthopedics parts is neat because it's fun and you can you can do the uh, you know fix the knee, replace the knee, fix the broken bone, but I don't know if if you found what I found, Gary, is that you know a lot of what when, when I when I was in medical school, you know and I was looking at all the specialties you can pick. I was, you know, I was an athlete, so I naturally gravitated to orthopedics, but I was really put off by some of the primary care stuff because what I saw continuously was, you know, you go to, you, you take care of these patients, come with their, their diabetes or their blood pressure problems, and they never got better. And all you did was prescribe the next pill. And, and, and then basically it was, you just blame the patient. You said, well, the patients aren't listening. They don't care. It doesn't matter. It's kind of, it's kind of almost a fruitless endeavor, but at least in orthopedics, if somebody comes in and they, you know, they break their femur, you know, you can rod their femur and they're walking the next day, you know, and that was like, well, that's really cool. But then as you get into orthopedics over a period of time, you start to see, well, what am I seeing now? Well, it's not every day I'm, I'm rotting femurs. Now I'm treating chronic tendonitis or chronic arthritis or chronic you know, peripheral neuropathy or all these diseases of, of basically bad nutrition, basically. And, and that's what I come to find that about 80% of what I was treating as a general orthopedist was just stuff that probably could have been prevented. I don't know if you share a similar uh, sort of uh, experience, but I suspect you might. Well, I think um, on that personal note, I touched base with you a couple of years ago when I think you're in the midst of it all and I was in the midst of my battles. Uh, and I think we, uh, we we gain support from each other. I remember, oh, crikey, it might be about five or six years ago, Robert Lustig and I had a chat over Christmas for about an hour, just recharging each other's batteries because, you know, doctors talking about sugar, you can't talk about that. So I think the common ground here, and this, and this is what's threatening, I think, for the system, is that actually when doctors start talking about low carving and, you know, reducing sugar, and that's different to celebrities talking about it. We've, and, it, it, and you know, as surgeons, uh, often that's seen as a point of uh, transition for patients. And if you actually go to a surgeon, they're uh, more likely to be able to get patients to stop smoking than, than the, in your normal general practitioner or your, your normal MD. So we're actually seen as points of crisis for people. And it's actually a great opportunity to, you know, create intervention. You're yeah. absolutely right in that you know, the majority of our orthopedic conditions are actually preventable, even through to the fact that osteoarthritis now is actually being seen more as an inflammatory arthritis. Uh, and sure, the end stages of osteoarthritis um, are that you need to, you, know, you may need a joint replacement, or you may need a procedure on your joint depending on where it is in the body. But what I'm seeing is that, uh, particularly around the knee, 
that people, when they reduce their sugar and carbs to processed food, you know, they do LCHF, you know, whether or not you go to the extremes of carnivore. And I, I, I don't actually think carnivore is nearly as extreme as people are making it out to be. But when they do that, they lose their arthritis pain or it improves before they lose their weight. You know, and I, I, I'm actually seeing that regularly. I'm working with a few rheumatologists now and starting to see the, see the same effect. And they don't want to call it LCHF, they want to call it the anti-inflammatory diet. But it's exactly the same thing. I don't care what people call it as long as they get on and give it a try. Yeah, I mean, I, I found... Are you uh, seeing that? I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing that. Absolutely, Gary. And that was one of the things that, that really was, intrigued me because, you know, as, as you and I were taught, you know, if you go through and you read any of our textbooks, you'll look at the treatment, you know, algorithms for any of the, you know, any of the things. And, and diet is never mentioned at any point, certainly not a low-carb diet. You never see that or an anti-inflammatory diet mentioned in the orthopedic literature. In any, in any review article on any condition that I've ever been aware of, I read these articles and it's, you know, it's straight to the anti-inflammatory, straight to the, cor you know, the corticosteroid injections, the therapy losing weight, so on and so forth. They never talk about diet. And that is absolutely the truth. And what I saw was people would come in in the absence of any significant weight loss and say, my joint pain is dramatic better. And, you know, you look at the, you know, you have people with arthritic pain in their fingers. And it's like, you know, they're not walking on their fingers. They're weighted, you know, their, their fingers don't hurt because they're overweight. You know, they, 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 hurt, they hurt because they're inflamed, whether it's, you know, the, the, the classic osteoarthritis with the Heberdeen nodes, the Bouchard's nodes that you see, that stuff gets better, not to mention the rheumatoid arthritis that, again, is, is you know, obviously a highly inflammatory um, uh, condition, you know, that we traditionally, you know, we divide them up into in, inflammatory arthropathies and non-inflammatory arthropathies and osteoarthritis being the, the most widely recognized non-inflammatory arthropathy. But... Uh, yeah, I absolutely saw that. And, you know, I, I saw it to the point where I had patients that were joint replacement candidates, you know, just because they had so much pain. And I put them on a ketogenic diet at the time and their pain went away. And we just said, well, then you don't need surgery. What's the point? You know, it's not like, you know, unless their joint was, you know, widely unstable or deformed. If they, if, it were, if the main reason was for doing the, the procedure, which is generally the main reason we do these joint replacements is to relieve pain, they no longer have pain. There's no, there's no point in doing the surgery, and I found that interesting. I also saw, and you may have seen that postoperatively, that the patients had less swelling, inflammation, and pain postoperatively, which I think is also uh, Absolutely. underrated. Absolutely. I'm trying to measure that, but it's very hard to actually uh, to actually do a study, uh, you know, actually assessing pain. But I can guarantee that the patients that are running ketogenic, you know, very low carb, when they have their procedures, they need less pain relief. Uh, look, I, I've had both. I've both had both of my hips replaced in the last few years. I was not not particularly happy about it. Um, but, you know, I wore them out from a combination of you know sport and running. And sorry, Zach, too much running. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I I had a highly inflammatory, high sugar, high carb diet, high polyunsaturated diet as a kid growing up, and I, you know, I was fueling myself on sugar. And I honestly believe, in retrospect, that I was destroying my joints in that process. Um, anyway, the last hip replacement I had, I just had it on paracetamol, or you know what you guys call acetaminophen. And uh, you know, it was sore the first four hours, but then after that, I didn't have any of the side effects of all those drugs and painkillers and constipation and brain fog that you get with all those other medications. And and I've got patients who are running, you know, that run you know, aggressively low carb with their procedures and they seem to get better quicker and again very hard to prove you know and people will say oh you're just making that up but it's another lot of you know, multiple n equals one studies yeah you know one thing that i always find interesting and you guys are in a different field than i am for sure with the orthopedic surgery and stuff but um when when you mentioned like the hips and the in the sugar fueling when you were younger and stuff you know one of the the I guess maybe biggest piece of the blowback that I'll usually get when I advocate for a low carb, high fat approach to endurance training is, you know, people will say, well, look at all these Olympic medalists and world record holders. They're all following high carb diets. Show me where the low carb Olympic gold medalist is. And, you know, we're really kind of missing the point at, for most people in that circumstance, when it's like, we're looking at someone who's not only way more genetically gifted than most people, but also in the peak of their, their prime, like, you know, these, these Olympic medalists are typically in their twenties or thirties and, uh, you know, they're, they're robust yet enough where they're, they're more, more than likely getting away with something as opposed to like really fine tuning their health and their longevity. Uh, you know, so for me, I'm always 
thinking a little bit differently. And it's like if I have this, if an athlete who says, you know, a 43 year old man, and you know, we start working together, and he's he has 20 pounds of extra weight that he hasn't been able to shed for whatever reason following a standard American diet. Uh, and we, we switch that around all of a sudden he drops that extra weight. It's like, there's not a workout in the world I could give him that would get him to be faster with that extra 20 pounds than, you know, me just simply getting him into a, with a nutritional approach that's sustainable for him where, you know, he's, he's able to, you know, eat and intuitively feed himself, trust his hunger mechanisms and things like that, and not find himself like in that position where I've got extra weight but I'm still hungry. This doesn't make sense. And, you know, that's always been kind of my, the way I've looked at it is like, we're, we're not necessarily looking, we're not branching out nearly enough to encompass the entire population, uh, especially when we're, you know, advocating for things like uh, really sugary foods and things like that. Uh, I think what the, you know, rather than look at the Olympians at the peak of their, their effort, and I'll call it effort rather than achievement, because I think they could probably achieve another layer better if they were actually running you know, keto. Um, look at the ex-Olympians, and you've only got to look at the you know, uh, sports broadcasters that are 10, 15, 20 years down the track. They're not a healthy-looking group. Mm-hmm. And uh, your American gridiron group have been well and truly studied. Uh, they have massive rates of diabetes, obesity, uh, and, uh, and metabolic syndrome. Um, and we look at here in Australian footballers, you know, I just watched a bit of um, what's called our state of origin here last night, and the, uh, the broadcasters afterwards aren't, are not a healthy looking group. But they, you know, they're the ex-professionals. Uh, and that's that's the group to look at. You know? So when the Olympians say, uh, you know, or they say Olympians are you know, at their peak potential, yeah, absolutely, they're doing great, but they, they don't shape up that well 10, 20, 30 years down the track when you look at them. Yeah, I think that's a that's a valid point, Gary. And I think, you know, the people that will say, well, that's that's the price they need to pay. It's just like the same reason they abuse drugs and do other things. You know, it's just all based on performance. And, you know, health is a secondary consideration. And I certainly don't think there's a lot of people that would disagree with that, you know, mindset. You know, there's a lot of polls when people said, would you would you be willing to shorten your life by 10 years if it got your gold medal? And most of them would say yes. So I think there is certainly that attitude that, you know, win at all costs, do whatever you can to win. But I agree that um, I think, that's only because what Zach is saying, it's only because that's the way it's been done. And, you know, it's like the same thing with everything. You know, we've always sort of done it the same way just because, and, and we, we don't start to question that. Now, now I think, and one of the things, and Tim Noakes talks about this is the fact that, you know, we have something, he, he calls it the wisdom of the crowds. I just, you know, I just talk about this tremendous interconnectivity we have now. And we have people that are willing to step outside the box and do crazy things like eat just meat or, you know, do other do other weird things, you know, run 100 miles or whatever and see what's actually happens. And, and rather than we have all this theoretical stuff and we have this associational stuff and this sort of speculation. And then when we actually when I call it when the rubber actually meets the road and you see what's actually going on, we're finding out that a lot of the, the, the sort of preconceived ideas we had sort of fall by the wayside. And I think that's what we're seeing here. I think we're seeing it, you know, just to just to kind of go back to rugby a little bit. I know you talked about rugby rugby league and the state of origin, but when we talk about rugby union, you know, I've got we've got a guy, uh, Owen Franks, who's a New Zealand all black and he's now on a he was on a keto diet and now he's on a carnivorous diet and he is playing at the highest level. You know, the New Zealand All Blacks are, you know, obviously the you know, no 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 disrespect to the wallabies, but you know, no, they, they, you know they they've they've the got Blacks the blood play- yeah, I mean they're 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 clearly the dominant team in the world on rugby, and he's a, he's a member of that and competing at the highest level on a on an all meat diet. And so I think it's you know I think we have to start looking at some of these other uh, you know other people that are doing this and say you know maybe we need to test this stuff more thoroughly and not just uh, make these assumptions based on what we've always done. The the All Blacks uh, won the last World Cup uh, uh, running low carb, and. Um, I um, was sitting in between uh, Grant Schofield, who's Professor of Public Health in New Zealand, and Peter Bruckner, who's well known as a sport, very senior sports uh, physician here in Australia and around the world. And uh, he's obviously an Australian. And it was at the eve of the final of the World Cup uh, match, and uh, the, um, they were having a wager. We were all three of us were in a Q and A on stage, and. Um, Grant was obviously going for the All Blacks and uh, Peter was clearly going for the Wallabies. They're having good old Barney about it. And then Grant leaned across and said, oh, by the way, Peter, uh, All Blacks are running low carb. And I went, oh, crikey. So I'm here as an Australian. I'm going to have to put my money on New Zealand. (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, I, guess, I don't know. If you're in Tasmania, does that are you considered true, all, fully Australian, or is that some sort of kind of a redheaded stepchild type place, or how does that work with Tasmania? Oh, I've been you know, exiled as far away from civilization as they can make it. And um, but I, I look at Tasmania. You know, we, some people look at it as a little island. We think it's a big island off the south of Australia. Um, I look at it as uh, probably like a lifeboat to the rest of the world. See you later, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, one of the great things about Tasmania is that um, we we have access to um, plenty of fresh local seasonal food, good markets. We've got. Um, at a, you know, great rainfall, we've got a temperate climate. I'm not trying to sell it as a tourist destination, but it, it is actually an oasis. Uh, we're, we're pretty well, or can be fossil fuel free as well. So I've written a white paper uh, about the fact that you know, Tasmania and the South Island of New Zealand may just be the only two places to get, you know, when it all goes, um, heads down, down the tube, but it's a good spot to be. So. Please don't, you know, you might have to edit that out because I don't want us to be inundated by the rest of the world. Yeah, I, I, you have, uh, you don't have ca kangaroos or anything inundating you guys right now? or? Well, okay, Zach, I, I can't turn the camera around, but about 15 metres from me outside of my study window here is a kangaroo. And actually, no, I lie, there's two of them. So um, I'm not making that up. I've actually got two kangaroos <laughs> sitting outside my front, front, outside my front window. Nice. What, Gary, just what, I mean, just because, you know, and, and I know, you know, if you talk about Professor Schofield out, out, in, out, in, out of Auckland, I know he wrote a paper about, and I think he called it the unifying theory of chronic disease, where he pointed the finger squarely at hyperinsulinemia. And I, you know, and, and one of the things that disappointed me in that paper is he didn't mention arthritis, because I think arthritis falls into that category as well. And, you know, I think that is something that, you know, people just sort of you know, again, you know, they don't consider arthritis a, a metabolic problem. And I think I think arthritis in many, not always, obviously, there's post-traumatic arthritis and some of the other things. But I think the general thing is that arthritis in many cases is just an orthopedic manifestation of metabolic disease. I mean, what do you, would you, would you say there's some truth into that? Or what is your thought on that? Absolutely. In the last 12 months, I've actually found quite a few papers that are re-looking at osteoarthritis as an inflammatory condition. And, uh, you know, and it really needs to be redefined as another form of inflammatory arthritis. And we've been all we've raised in our textbooks and our mentors have all thought of it just as a, wear, a worn out disease, but in fact, it's not that. And, we, and it clearly picked by the fact that if you have osteoarthritis of the hip and knee, it's actually often associated with osteoarthritis of, of the thumb, the CMC joint. And clearly, you're not walking around on your thumbs. And, uh, so... There's current research that's going down that pathway. Um, you know, on the money side, but there aren't many orthopedic surgeons that want to abandon their, their their orthopedic career and go off and do primary research in osteoarthritis. Um, but I've actually got a colleague here in Australia, um, and I'll Phil Phil Allen, who's in fact doing exactly that. He's come on board with this concept of um, exactly what we're talking about: osteoarthritis, metabolic syndrome, inflammation. And he's actually taken some time out of his career uh, off to doing um, the primary laboratory research. Now, that's a brave move on, on, on multiple fronts, but he feels as passionate as you and I do, that he's actually got a, a, a research uh, concept and he's, you know, harvesting cartilage and wants to, uh, you know, to look at the, exactly that metabolic syndrome. But it, it, as you say, there's nothing in the literature about it from an insulin aspect, but you know, on the front, you know, when you're actually seeing people, you know, that's that what's that's what starts the research. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, like I said, it's you know, the the the, the hypothesis has to start somewhere, and it's just as good coming from uh, you know a bunch of anecdotes from your observation. That's the whole definition of science. You make an observation and you say, you know, this doesn't really make sense. It doesn't match what I've been taught. Let's let's question the theory. And there's there's a lot of backlash. At this point, you know, when you start questioning theories, because now that's questioning someone's financial bottom line, and so there's obviously a lot of backlash in that. But I see, I mean, the number of people, you know, going on either a low-carb or ketogenic carnivore diet that tell me their joint pain, their tendinopathy got better is staggering. I mean, it is, it is one of the most common 
you know, uh, things I see, you know, the same thing, and a lot of times it's mental health and a lot of times it's digestion, but, you know, very classically, it's, you know, my plantar fasciitis went away, my low back pain went away, my knee pain went away. You know, I had an ACL and I've always had knee pain, you know, H- torn ACL, it was fixed. My knee, my knee's been hurting me chronically. And it's gone away. I mean, it's, it's just the num- you know, at some point you can't ignore it when it, when it happens every single day. And I think there's, there's just so much there. And I think it, 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 it literally, you know, I, I can't tell you how much, you know, I'm sure, you know, you, you've given out a lot of, you know, uh, uh, ibuprofen or whatever COX-2 inhibitors over the years. And I, and I did, you know, I, I did that and pl- plenty of corticosteroid shots. And now I would say, if I had my druthers and a, and a patient would do it, I would say, go on his diet first before you did any of that stuff. Because I think that the efficacy not only is probably better, but the, the side effects and, and the potential downsides are, are basically none as far as I can see. Well, what's fascinating is I have not prescribed an anti-inflammatory for osteoarthritis for four years, five years. So uh, I'll still use some cortisone shots, but um, in the acute phase of getting people over things, but actually writing that prescription out um, just hasn't happened. I'm a great believer in de-prescribing, uh, you know, getting people off medication. Uh, a lot of your listeners probably don't realise that the majority of medications, virtually every medication is only tested in isolation, and most times in history has actually been on 70 kilo males. We have got very little understanding of how medications actually work in our body and yet we've got even less of an understanding of when you actually mix them up with a combination of drugs um, and you'll have seen that when patients come into hospital you know they're on a drug chart that they're on five ten different medications and uh, excuse the language but it's just a chemical shitstorm. we actually have no idea what's going on with all that all of those drug interactions and yeah Yet, yet people say, oh, you know, it's dangerous to go and do keto or change your diet. I mean, people, it's just phenomenal how people actually come off these medications when they, when they, uh, when they change their diet. I, I, I had a cancer coming up to 19 years ago now. And um, at uh, my peak worst uh, time, I was on 10 medications uh, with it. And... Uh, over time, I've come off them all, a bar, you know, half a tablet of something called dexamethasone because I've got Addison's. I need to actually stay alive. But it's, uh, you know, changing my diet has meant that I've been able to come off a whole lot of drugs, including chemotherapy for that cancer. So, I mean, we've got to start looking at de-prescribing rather than adding in more tablets, you know, treating one, com- uh, uh, one complication of a medication with another tablet. You know, it's crazy out there. Yeah, you know, one thing that I always think about with like, you know, topics like that where, you know, the the less time consuming or the easy thing to do is, you know, write that prescription and send them on their way. The hard thing to do is to sit down with them and explain to them, let's overhaul your nutrition plan, which means I have to teach you what to do. You know, that's more time consuming. Uh, you know, and I, I'll, I'll see that in, in, I think, with coaching and stuff as well, where, uh, you know, if you have a client coming to you, they're like, okay, let's get this, this running program in place. And the client says, I'm also interested in like what I should be eating. You know, what's my nutrition? What should I do for that? You know, the easy thing is just to say, oh, well, you know, here's the, the standard protocol of, you know, X amount of carbohydrates, you know, this thing in more or less a standard American diet. You can, you can make it look a little prettier by saying focus on whole foods rather than junk foods, but it's, it's a very easy conversation to say that and you send them on their way. The hard thing to do is to say, uh, if the person, especially if the person's interested, is say, okay, well, if you want to try a ketogenic diet, well, let's learn how to do this and let's do it right. You know, as a coach, that's essentially an extra task to do. So uh, f- for me, you know, I'm fortunate, I guess, in the sense that I've dove into that world enough where I can kind of more or less recognize a bunch of the red flags and uh, help someone a little more easier than someone who's maybe never really dove into the high fat world. But, you know, I can't help but think there's a lot of coaches out there who for, for, you know, just, you know, taking the easy way out is you have a client come and say, I'm kind of interested in this. Can you point me to some resources? And then just say, no, that doesn't work. It's been proven not to work because they know by saying yes, they're going to have to do more work to help that person kind of figure that stuff out and more or less learn with them as opposed to just regurgitate information that's already out there. Two points about that. 
last night I went around and caught up with a mate who's recently been diagnosed with diabetes. And I was explaining it to both him and his wife and then uh, talking about giving them some information. And yes, I was giving specific advice if the medical board is listening into this. <laughs> and um, uh, and then we cooked a meal together, you know, cut some great steaks and some vegetables. And, and anyway, the long and the short of it is that took two hours to educate him and his wife on, on, on how to turn his life around. And he gets it, but it took two hours. Now, you, you, none of us have got two hours to spend that time. Well, I suppose we do, but you know, it's not commercially viable, I can guarantee it. But it, it, you mentioned the word teach. Um, in Latin, the word uh, doctor uh, means to teach. It doesn't mean to make money. It doesn't mean to care for. It doesn't mean to operate. It actually means to teach. So if we're all teaching each other or teaching others, then actually we're, we're becoming true doctors. And the sad thing about medicine, and you can actually go back to 1910, uh, between 1900 and 1910, um, uh, Rockefeller and Carnegie got involved in our medical education. It's a little known fact, and they involved changing up the, uh, the way we looked at education in medicine. And uh, we all of a sudden, the modern medical education system was born, which was to uh, to medicate and to operate, and we lost the art of to educate. Now, as doctors, we'd like to think we're educating, but as Sean and I have alluded to, you know, it's much easier just to go and reach for the prescription pad and medicate or talk people into operating. And if you actually stop giving people drugs and if you stop operating on them, you know, it, it changes the cash flow for yourself and for the, the hospital and for the pharmaceutical industry. And and that's why Sean and I have gotten into trouble. It's not because we're not giving good medical care. I think we've just trodden on too many toes around us who, are, who unfortunately, have got vested interests, and they can't see it sometimes. Yeah, I mean, the education is now educating people on what procedure you're going to do and how the drug works. I mean, that, that's, that's our educational role. But, I mean, you know, and, and I, I want to go to another point because you and, and Belinda do a great job of talking about some of this stuff when we talk about the, the, the dietary, the evolution of the dietary and the dietitians associations. But, you know, back when, when the American medical schools were being founded, you know, some of the, in, into, the, into the 1900s, you know, that's when the pharmaceutical industry started to – to creep in there and have influence. And now you see that, you know, much of your, your, your curriculum is how to recognize disease and what is the appropriate drug to give for this, or what is a particular procedure. And we don't, we don't talk about anything lifestyle or, you know, it's, it's given lip service at best, just like, you know, the, the whole prevention care is given minimal funding, lip service at best. And we don't, we don't have any teeth into the, into that situation. But, you know, if you look at a, if you look at a standard, uh, well, at least when I get my when I get my orthopedic journal journals, you know, I mean, they're they're ads. They're I mean, every third page is some ad for some, you know, uh, you know, hip replacement system or some COX two inhibitor or some uh, anticoagulant. I mean, it's filled with these, these ads, and we see that time and time again. We have these ex uh, medical journal or editors are saying that that all medical journals are now are basically. Uh, advertising for for some of these drug companies. Now, you know, again, that's that's maybe painting too broad a brush, but I mean, certainly there is a huge, huge influence that that is out there, and I think that's something that uh, it's really hard uh, to 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 appreciate. You know, just because you're kind of immersed in it, so you kind of don't see the forest for the trees, and and then you know, and then to step away from that's even harder because there there it's really difficult to do. Well, I was very concerned recently to find out that um, my basic medical textbooks, I don't know, if you've got Harrison's over there? Yeah, Harrison's Internal Medicine, sure. Did you see that, uh, how much the authors of that, uh, have, how many millions that actually received? And so here we have, you know, the Bible of tech and medicine. Um, you know, that was my, my 21st birthday present from my father was to give me Harrison's. And then to find out how many millions of dollars the pharmaceutical industry has injected into the author's bank's bank accounts. Um, uh, our medical education, uh, pharmaceutical education has come from the pharmaceutical industry. Our, our food education has come from the food industry. And uh, both of those are just profit-driven organisations who are not particularly interested in our health outcomes. And I know that sounds cynical and it's conspiratorial, but guess what? The last several years of all this research has actually come down to that. It's actually not about the science. And it, 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 you, you, know, you speak about Belinda. She's my wife and she's an ex-nurse. And 
she was saying for many years, you know, that you and Tim and others are just talking about the science and you're getting hammered about it. Um, why on earth? You, why on earth isn't the system not listening? Because the results are there. You know, people do this; they turn it around, but it, it threatens the existence of many. So, a lot of her work's been about you know, let's look at the vested interests. And as you say, it all comes back down to um, the origins of our food guidelines. And uh, back in 1917, the American Dietetics Association was formed. Uh, the person who started that wrote the textbooks for the next 40 years. Uh, they actually were heavily involved in writing the nursing textbooks for the first few decades. And again, uh, when you look at all that funding, the funding actually came not from the pharmaceutical industry, but actually came from a religious group who had you know, this vegetarian bias and uh, ultimately owned 60 publishing houses, including multiple medical journals. And, uh, you know, back to old um, John Harvey Kellogg's wanting us to promote um, uh, cereal and grain. And, you know, it gets a little bit messy, that topic, but since we raised it, and I, that talk I gave at the CrossFit Games last year, the CrossFit uh, Health International, um, that's pretty well opened up Pandora's box because we're now no longer the only people um, you know, talking about the fact of the fact of the role of religion in um, in shaping our food guidelines, the dietary guidelines, our nursing guidelines, and, and the medical textbooks, and it all comes back down to religious belief from the, the late nineteenth century that meat causes cancer, meat causes violence, um, uh, meat uh, you know is bad for you. That whole vegetarian movement was. It has origins within the Adventist Church and the temperance movement of the 1860s. And then that flowed on to John Harvey Kellogg's and the development of cereal. And uh, you, I think you guys know, have heard about you know, why cereal was invented. Yeah, it was, I mean, it, it, supposedly to suppress uh, lusty uh, desires, yeah, lusty, I think. Yeah, you know, to, to get down to the nitty gritty, and it's actually written down, in, 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 and you can still get available all the material now. Let's face it, that cereal was invented to, to prevent us from masturbating, to quell our lustful thoughts. 101 cereal companies were born around Battle Creek, Michigan, uh, largely owned by um, the Adventist um, uh, population. And then they, they, you know, they brought that to Australia, and uh, uh, LNG White, and, um, and Sanitarium in Australia and New Zealand was born. And they effectively have started our dietetic guidelines of the world. It's a fascinating history. And the strongholds for them are actually, interestingly, um, uh, the US, um, uh, South Africa, and Australia. And, and guess where, you know, if you challenge that here, Tim Noakes in South Africa gets hammered. Um, I've gotten hammered here. Uh, Karen's in in New Zealand, which is another stronghold. Uh, We've upset some big players, but ultimately all we're doing is pointing out the origins that are actually all out there, you know, in the in the uh, on the internet, in their texts, uh, in the writings of Ellen G. White. Interestingly, um, the uh, Seventh Day Adventist Church brought soy to the U.S. You know, the, the concept of fermented soy which came out of China, and um, they brought that concept and then expanded it uh, by fellow of China, Harry Miller, um, into the US. And the soy industry, arguably at its commercial levels, um, has origins uh, in that in that church group into its production. So they, they are so vertically integrated and horizontally integrated into our health provision. So whenever I actually think about soy and the, all of the soy oils and the inflammation associated with the estrogen effects of soy and the fact that it's all in the fake meat and fake dairy, um, those markets, this is, this is the health implications of the world right there in front of us. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that Belinda has been doggedly researching and researching for some years, but it's all there when you start looking. So I highly recommend you, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm plugging my talk or Belinda's talk, you look up Belinda Fetke and Dietary Guidelines or Gary Fetke and that CrossFit talk, it's all summarised there and it's, you know, it's your first step into a whole, whole, new, um, whole new world. 
because we've all been blaming Ansel Keys and with, you know, for the, and, and the McGovern report, but it's actually got origins well before that. So how on earth did, you know, Keys get his ideas about that being a problem? And we suspect it was, you know, he was raised under that medical education system that was, you know, we were all, we we're all byproducts of you know, what I call decades of um, uh, generational education. I mean, you believe your teachers, and if your teachers have been told the same thing before that, uh, it all becomes, you know, the paradigm and the dogma, and that's what we've all been trying to overturn for the last you know, several years. Yeah, yeah I think. Know... Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say what you said there at the end was um, something that I, I really kind of uh, find interesting because like when, when before I moved out west, I was a teacher for a few years at, at a high school and you know I started out with a more of a traditional classroom. You, you, were, a you were a doctor at a high school. No, definitely not. No. <laughs> no, no yes, you were. You were a teacher. A uh, teacher, yes. I was a teacher. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I did that for a few years. And the last, the last job I had for two years before moving was uh, a school that had a little more of a less traditional approach. And the, the cool thing about it was it basically kind of put the teachers in a position where you were no longer this figure that the students came into the classroom and you had all the answers. And it was just their responsibility to sit and listen to you kind of, um, you know, wax poetic all this information and um, it was more your job to, you know, find the student's interest and then learn with them. And, uh, that was, I remember thinking the first time I, I, I did that, it was, it's kind of hard to let go of that, that perceived responsibility that you have to be the smartest person in the room and realize, okay, this, this student might have an interest in a topic that they know way more about than I do. It's my role to kind of help facilitate, not my role to tell them, you know, that, you know, teach them something new in terms of more content. And I think that kind of reverberates out into like all kinds of professions where, you know, the populace or the people, they, they think like, okay, this person's a doctor, they have all the answers. And, you know, the doctors don't always have all the answers and they're kind of being put into a, a goofy spot where they're feeling this pressure, I think, that like they have to have all the answers. They have to be perceived as the smartest person in the room or they're not doing their job or they're not good at their job. And um, it kind of puts them into a, a, a weird situation. And then you get someone like uh, like Professor Tim Noakes who has been very bold and open in saying, I was wrong in the past. This is why. This is what I see now. And then the backlash he gets is, well, you know, what are you going to tell us in 10 years that you're wrong about this? So like the message that sends to any, any professional that they, you know, have the flexibility to say they were wrong and, and correct something is, is it, 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 all, it skews it away from that because it's like who wants to get that kind of backlash? Oh, look, Zach, I used to be the cake judge at the hospital. And uh, I wouldn't take kids' plasters off unless they brought me a chocolate cake. It was you know, a <laughs> method of distraction. Um, but you know, just going back to your original point, I would like to say that there is not a day that goes by in my clinical practice that a patient doesn't teach me something. Now, I don't know all the answers. I, I don't have it 100% right. I think this whole low-carb concept of you know eating a less inflammatory diet is a long way to go. And it's more right than wrong. But I still don't have all the answers. And anybody who is arrogant enough to say they do, or is, you know, or is, you know, as we've all come up against is arrogant to say that we're completely wrong has got a closed mind uh, and I, I'm still learning I, I learn every day you know stuff that's up on Twitter you know it's a constant feed off I look at research articles I'm reading stuff and and that's the fun thing at my age and I'm years older than you guys but I'm, I'm you know 55 and I'm still learning and so many of my medical colleagues have you know pulled up the ladder, they've stopped learning. And I, I realise that's harsh. They might say they're keeping up to date. But I am constantly learning, and that's just fascinating. It's got, and that, that's, you know, that's, I'm still like a little kid, you know, enthusiastically opening up journals. And and um, my colleagues, I think, look at me a bit strangely when I, you know, in my briefcases, you know, half a dozen new articles every day. 
Yeah, I think that that's a that's an excellent point, Gary, and I and I, I totally totally echo that. You know, it's something where we where I hear the science is settled or consensus says, and I'm saying, wait a minute, you didn't ask me, and I don't agree with this. And you know, it's it's just you know when we go back to this, you know, back to the Adventists, you know, a lot one of the you know because I get I, I get back and forth with a lot of the vegan vegan uh, proponents, and they'll always point to this this Adventist health study, and you know, you, again, it goes back to where where is their origin, and do they have some bias in there, and they most certainly do. But, you know, you can even go look at the, you know, the, the what is it, the Howard Chan, I think it's Howard Chan School of Medicine at Harvard, where Walter Willett is a, is a director and he's a vegan. And so we've got this, you know, we've got these vested interests uh, sort of pushing out this message, which I think is very conflicted. But, yeah, I, I agree, you know, and it's something I talked to with, uh, I can't remember who, maybe Ivory yesterday. Uh, we talk about, you know, if I've got a patient that has some medical condition, you know, and, and, and very, particularly if it's something that's a little unusual, something I don't see very often, they more likely than not have more knowledge about that than I do because they live with it every single day. And if they're, in, if they're inquisitive, if they're intelligent, you know, they've got skin in the game and they're going to research and understand and learn. I know that's what I would do. If I came down with some weird disease, I would be learning every single thing about it. And I would probably know more than anybody treating me for the most part, unless I went to the world's leading expert. But I mean, you know, as a, as a general doctor, you can learn a ton from your patients, and I learn it every day, and I still learn from people, you know, just just on this internet stuff. And I think the, uh, you know, we've had this traditional method of learning. You know, it's been handed down to us. You know, Tim talk, Tim Noakes talks about eminence based science or medicine, and I think that is slowly unraveling. And I think we talked about with Ivor, we talked about a democratization of health and and medicine, and when we're having people all these thousands upon thousands and even, you know, even into the millions of people that all have skin in the game. They're living this stuff 24 seven and they're coming together, forming groups, forming tribes, forming societies where they're saying, we're going to figure out how to, how to do this. And, and, and some of that doesn't work and that's fine, but some of it does. And we have to, you know, look through that and say, and pick through that and find the gold there. And I think there's a lot of gold that can be, can be mined when you, when you look through all these groups and say, wait a minute, all of you guys did this, and, you know, 90 percent of you guys, your knee pen went away. Well, there's something there. And, and I don't care if there hasn't been a randomized controlled trial study yet. It may come down the road. But at the same time, you can't dismiss this stuff. Um, we, we could, we're trying to work out which, how many different paths to go there. Uh, I think we need to think about that the, the scientific method is up for question at the moment. The null hypothesis might, in fact, be null and void. I had a chat with Richard Feynman about that last year. Um, we, we've everything's up for challenge we need the concept of actually the scientific method of you know coming up with a hypothesis then testing it and then retesting it and then implicating it is biased at every level of research you know right through from the formulation of the of the the, the hypothesis through to the study design ethics committee uh, uh, bias uh, then you've got observer bias then you've got writer bias you've got editorial bias, you've even got readership bias now. I, I think the scientific method is you know, a struggle to, 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 to maintain its hold and we need to maybe look at uh, uh, systems analysis, which is why the engineers are so good at it. They look at all the data and they just put, put it together and say, hang on, this works, particularly in diabetes. Did, I don't know if you saw that article Frederick Leroy, Leroy put up. It's a Swiss article looking at, re-looking at the meat causes cancer debacle uh, literature that was put out by the World Health, Health Organization. Uh, and it, that was only a mild association, but it got enormous amounts of airtime, even though it was pretty well a political document rather than a scientific document. Um, and uh, they took out all of the Adventist studies uh, from that um, review, and there's no association with, uh, at all with meat causes cancer. Uh, so, you know, groups that are reviewing literature, and the Harvard TC Chan has a disproportionate amount of uh, School of Public Health has a disproportionate amount of power in this in this world, and Walter Willett, you know, he he wields again a disproportionate amount of of, of influence over guidelines. And when you start looking down at guidelines for the last hundred years, it, um, there's actually only a small number of players who actually have the time and the effort, the, determ the determination and the finance to actually keep plugging away at these committees. It, it's hard work to actually take on the system. You know, we all know that. Um, it takes an enormous amount of time, effort, family support and dollars. And I, I know what, how much it's cost us in all of those factors. 
Um, and so as individuals, we're going to struggle. We can be mosquitoes in the room, um, but I'd, I'd much rather be a mosquito in the room rather than a fly on the wall watching it all go by. And um, kudos to, uh, to you guys for also being mosquitoes in the room. It's pretty hard to swat us down, by the way. <laughs> Well, and that's the thing, you know, because somebody said, somebody said, well, aren't you worried that, you know, some drug company is going to get mad and do something bad to you? I said, you know, the, you know, the cat's out of the bag, the toothpaste's out, you know, it's, it's gone. It's already started, you know, yeah, we're, absolutely. It's, it's, there's so many people involved in, and in, in what I try to do is, you know, try to, you know, be a cheerleader and get other people to, to, to be more vocal and to step up and, you know, step up for themselves and, and, and really look into this stuff. And I think more people are doing that. I, you know, I, I think it's inevitable that, um, you know, as long and unless, you know, unless we move to, uh, you know, North Korea where they shut down the Internet and they and they decide that we're going to control all the information. But at least at this point, there are challenges going up every day. And it's confusing to a lot of people because some people they'll hear one thing, they'll hear something else. But I think the ultimate thing is the proof is what's going to what's going to, you know, whatever what really happens, what are the actual results? People are going to see, hey, wait a minute. I, I didn't listen to my doctor who told me to go on a low fat, high fiber diet. And I, I just listened to this crazy guy, Gary Fetke in Australia, you know, the crazy guy that tells people not to eat sugar. And lo and behold, my diabetes went away. And, and you know, I think it's it's just, you know, when that happens enough times, and I think, that, I don't know if the critical mass has been reached. I, you know, again, we're kind of in a little bit of an echo chamber because we spent a lot of time in this low-carb world, and I don't know exactly how much impact we're having. Uh, but I suspect it's 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 growing, you know, by the by the week. You know, just just that's my impression. But, again, I don't know if we're considered – uh, you know, totally crazy or only partially crazy or, or you know, I think more and more people saying, well, maybe that works for some people. You know, you're getting that, well, it may work for some people, but it's not sustainable. You know, and they, and they throw out this, oh, yeah, well, it's good for losing weight short term, but, but you know, surely you're going to, it's going to shorten your life or give you cancer, or give you heart disease or some other scare tactic that they have. You know, it's basically what they're reduced to is saying, you know, well, we don't know what, it, we don't know what the results are going to be. And I, and I will say, tell me one diet that you have rigorously tested in a, you know, a, a 50 year randomized controlled fashion, controlling for confounders and absolutely confirmed what the results are. And those things don't exist and probably they never will exist because it's almost impossible to do. So, at, at, you know, at this point, that that sort of scaremongering technique, I think is just, you know, it's just all the only weapon they have left. Well, I call it disinformation. Um, like if it's uh, there's information out there, then there's misinformation, which just can be naivety. But disinformation, I call it, it's deliberately put out there by the industry. Very much the same tactics as the tobacco industry, just to keep it all messy. Uh, and because all we're actually advocating is eating fresh, local, seasonal food. Now, whether or not that's um, you know, um, what I'm talking about, uh, LCHF, whether or not it's carnivore, it is actually fresh, local and seasonal. And... There's nothing dangerous about it. And the only thing that's dangerous, it's dangerous to the bottom line of, of, of the food industry, the agricultural sector. Um, I'm working with um, uh, a few people here in Australia trying to actually um, influence and give in, or what we call it, information, to the agricultural sector about how they need to change going forward. Um, we, I can't... I can't shut up about this topic, as you know. You know, once you see the results, you can't unsee them. We talk about that all the time. And, but the trick is, how do we change the community? At a government level, it's going to be very hard. At the marketplace, you can, because you know the buy, you know the, the fruit juice section of the of the shops is, is decreasing. The margarine section is actually reducing in size. The butter section is increasing. People at the at the at the coal phase are changing. You can see that, and farmers' markets are increasing in popularity. Um, we, people are more interested now, not over the whole planet, but you know, at, at a small level, uh, in, interested in where their where their food's actually coming from, and looking at the mileage and the and the, uh, we, Tasmania. We have a thing called um, uh, farm to plate, and so that's um, got a role to play. The um, where was I heading with that? The um, I, you talk about our, how much it requires to change. Have you heard about committed sardines? I have not. No. No, it's a it's a ecological term of where 
you can see a school of fish turn around uh, on, you know, on a penny. They can just completely turn 180 degrees. Uh, and so they can do that in a blink. Whereas that school of sardines can get to the size of a sperm whale. And for a sperm whale to turn 180 degrees, it takes a few minutes. But a school of fish can turn 180 degrees immediately. And that, that term of how it happens is called a committed sardine. So at any point in time, there are fish on the outside there that are more agitated, more alert to danger, and are going to turn that school of fish around. And the critical mass is actually only 3%. So I, if we don't need to get 30, 40, 50% of people to turn around, we actually only need to get 3%. And I think we're approaching that sooner than people think. Um, and I, I look at, you know, when I started talking about this several years ago, everyone thought I was looking half stark mad. I think they still do, but I'm naive that I thought it would, you know, turn around a bit quicker than this. But more and more people are talking about it. The fact that I'm podcasting with you guys in the US, you know, from Tasmania, is, is part of that early adopters. So, you know, I think we're approaching the 3%. And when that happens, I think there's going to be a major social shift and the governments are going to you know, have to follow suit. I think that the, the house of cards is about to start tumbling down. It's starting to creak. You know, the walls of the dam are cracking. And uh, this is... Um, part of a good thing to be doing in society. Yeah, you know, I think one thing that I've always used as a bit of a, a test to kind of see like, where are we along the lines of making this at least more approachable or standard uh, within like, you know, someone who doesn't have a lot of knowledge being able to actually access the resources to, you know, execute a, a high fat, low carb diet or something different than the norm is like you go into the grocery store and look at the changes. And like you mentioned, like, you know, we're seeing things like the, the butter aisles are growing, the margin aisles are shrinking. And I know one of the things I first noticed was when I f first started a high fat, low carb approach, um, I kind of found out, you know, there are fats you want to avoid, like the seed, seed oil type stuff. And um, my first thought was, well, mayonnaise is off the table because there was no such thing as a mayonnaise that wasn't made with like a canola oil or something like that. And now you go into the store and there's a whole row of different types of mayonnaises that are made with like avocado and, you know, things that are more along the lines of what you would find in a, in a real like healthy keto approach. So, you know, what the market kind of got you, like if the market demands it, it's going to be there. So there must be enough people asking for this stuff that it's showing up into the stores the right way, at least in part. And I, I think that's probably a good compass going forward too, to see how things are how things are progressing. A lot of people say it's more expensive to eat this way. And I've got two replies to that. One is actually, if you're eating really fresh local seasonal, it's actually not more expensive in money, uh, but it is actually expensive in time. You know, it does require a bit more effort. You've actually got to go and do a bit more work. You've got to prepare your food rather than just pour it out of a packet. And the other thing is, if, even if it was more expensive, you've got a choice of spending time and a few dollars now uh, on your health and investing in the future or you got to spend you can you know spend that time uh time and money in your doctor's waiting room in the long term and uh, what i'm seeing is i see a lot of pretty certain sean will as well you know over time you see what i call my patients um, you know when they get older i say well look you're just becoming medical tourists you know, where's it? Where's your next uh, holiday well i'm going off to see the orthopedic surgeon now i'm going off to see my Physician, I'm going off to see the kidney specialist. I'm, I've got a, I've got a lovely trip planned to go off and have my blood tests today. And for a lot of people, that's what life is. They've become medical tourists. And yeah. um, I, 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 one of the things I had a lot of, I caught up with an accountant yesterday, not mine, but one as a patient. And she was uh, um, got some health issues. And I spoke to her and I said, look, um, you, you believe in your financial retirement. You, you spend time thinking about that. And I talk about the concept of dollar cost averaging. You know, if you invest a little bit over time, over and over and over, you're actually going to have a good financial retirement. I said, how, many, how much do you invest in your health retirement? And it's a concept most people have never thought of. And if you actually invest a little bit every day in your health retirement, chances are you're going to have a good, healthy, long life. 
And sure, you may be hit by a bus and it may all, you know, you might, the global financial crisis may hit you, but chances are if you start spending a bit of time and effort now on your health retirement every day, uh, that's a good idea. And if, but if you want to have a, you know, a meat pie covered in sauce and uh, coated and you know, cooked in vegetable oils, that's just, I, I just see that as a bad investment. And you wouldn't yeah. do it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that is some of the thing, you know, you think about people, you know, as, as, they're, as they're kind of working their way through life, and then they think about, I'm going to work for X amount of years, and then I'm going to retire, and I have this nice retirement, and I'm going to travel the world, and I'm going to do all these things that I that I couldn't do because I was too busy working. And then, you know, by the time they get to 65 or whatever it is, they retire, they can't do anything. I mean, they're they're literally, you know, they're in pain all the time. They're, you're exactly right. They become medical tourists. Their, their retirement goes go from getting one pill to the next pill to going to one doctor to the next doctor. And it's it's very sad to see. And I try to tell people, you know, because you see these people, you know, you see them in their 20s and, you you know, you, you just know where their life's going. You know, they're 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 in there for their, uh, you know, their rotator cuff surgery by 40, you know, by 55. They're in there for their knee replacement. You know, maybe their hips are a couple of years later and you, you know, or whatever. Their gallbladder's out at 45 and, you know, you, you know, and then they're on they're on their antidepressants and then they're on their blood pressure medicine you just see this stuff you know starting in their early 20s and it, and it just goes and then you try to catch these people and say look you know the, the, your genetics don't aren't your destiny there are a lot of things you can do that can that can that can mitigate that or change that but you know to your point about convenience and, and people pouring stuff out of the packet i saw a study where breakfast cereals in some cases meals were have time cereals because you got to wash it if you pour cereal and milk old you got two dirty dishes so we're not going to do that. So instead, we're going to go get some, uh, you know, something I can grab and eat by hand and, and because it, they've gotten that to the point where they don't even want to, you know, deal with anything other than just heat it up in the microwave, stick it in their mouth and throw the package in the garbage because breakfast cereal is, is too much work for them. So, you know, you tell them, hey, go scramble an egg, uh, you know, make an omelet. And, and, and you know, so it's, it's I, you know, I think that the loss of the ability and the desire to to cook healthy food is is a big problem, and I think we're you know we're raising a you know generation you know already that, that doesn't even know how to has no idea how to cook, and I think that's a, that's also a shame. Back to my favourite company here in Australia called Sanitarium. They have a breakfast in a in a container called Up and Go, um, which is literally that uh, parents give it to their kids in the back of the car, and it's um just it's a flavoured sort of milk process. Yeah, lump of garbage, uh, and it's and that's becoming you know a, a consumable for breakfast. So it's not it's not even taken out of the packet and put in the microwave. Um, I, I, I most breakfasts I have is an omelet made up with last night's leftovers, a bit of egg and cheese. Now it takes me the length of time to make that as it does for me to make a cup of tea for Belinda in the morning. Um, you know, I'll let out a trade secret. Belinda cannot wake up in the morning unless you bring her a cup of tea beside the bed. And so you know, that's what I put there. Um, in the length of time to make a cup of tea, I can make it, you know, a cooked breakfast. So, you know, when people say it's, uh, you know, it's too much effort, I go, well, come on, how many minutes do you actually have? Yeah, I mean, I, I make my kids eggs for breakfast and I, I can get an egg. You know, you know, if you if you plan it right, you know, you get the kids sitting around the table, you heat the pan up, you know, you got the eggs, you put it in there, and I mean, literally, they're done in a minute. You know. <laughs> oh, hey, but hang on, so that would actually involve communicating as a family and spending time together. Yeah, that's yeah, true. That's, that's that. dangerous as well, isn't it? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, take take them a minute away from their electronics and, and that stuff. That's that's a whole different topic. But uh, Gary, you I, you probably have to get to the OR. I'm I'm guessing. I don't know if you I have actually I, I I do guys, but. This, this yeah. is as well. No, it's been a pleasure, Gary. And, and are you going to be? Uh, are you doing any uh, traveling over the over the over the over the summer? Are you going to any local conferences? What's your schedule coming up in the near future? I'm, I'm actually I'm speaking in uh, Fiji at uh, the Polynesian conference. With, uh, with that the Blue Pacific, you know, the Polynesian islands are actually the most obese, highest rates of diabetes in the world. Actually, we we talk about the Western groups, but. The island nations of the South Pacific are in deep strife. So, Belinda and I are speaking there. We're off to um, the uh, low carb universe uh, meeting in Europe and Spain. Uh, I've been asked to speak to um, 400 doctors in, in, in Indonesia next year uh, talking about low carb. And that, that, that's exciting because we've got 400 doctors there who are interested in 
changing the, the health of an entire country. Um, uh, Doug's uh, asked me to come to uh, Low Carb USA next year. So we're, it's on our agenda. We just need um, an invitation. And um, unfortunately, it's just a long haul flight to get there. So, but I'm hopefully, if I get over there, I'm, I'm expecting I'm going to have a, um, a steak with you, okay? No, absolutely. I'm going to try to get down to that low carb San Diego one uh, this this summer because I'm I'm not far from there. So I'm going to definitely try to at least meet some people and and, and maybe have some steak with some folks. But uh, yeah, no, it'd be absolutely a wonderful time to to, to meet with you in person and uh, uh, meet you and Belinda and and uh, you know just kind of go through some different stuff. Um, well, Belinda's much nicer than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, she must be just an angel then because you're pretty nice. <laughs> uh, yeah. How many nice orthopedic surgeons are there apart from just the two of us, mate? Uh, there are some. There are some good guys out there, I think. But, uh, you know, you know, I saw that, that the orthopedics had won the uh, contest for the most swearing in the operating room. I saw a study on that. So, you know, it's, it kind of attracts a different a different type of uh, different type of person, that's for sure. Well, yeah. I think what, what orthopedics does, it attracts practically-minded people who are problem solvers rather than... Um, uh, just followers, because you have to get in orthopedics, as you know, you've got to do a lot of thinking on your feet. Uh, surgery is actually pretty straightforward until uh, a piece of equipment breaks, or you know, or you find some variation of anatomy, um, and uh, and you've got these uh, that you're operating on humans, so we've got all got variations. So I I think orthopedics lends itself to, to that practical. Uh, Problem solving, and that's what would. If you make a simple observation, uh, and how low carb helps people, you don't need to have it repeated to you a hundred or a thousand times before you start acting upon it. Yeah, and I that, mean, that's yeah, all I've done. I've gone, hang on, this is making sense. This works for me. I'm going to try it on a few others, and hang on, this is this is this is the way to go. Yeah, no, I agree 100 percent with it. Yeah, it's kind of interesting when you know, like when I was in when I was in Afghanistan, <laughs> and we had you know, you know, you you were trying to rod femurs and you know you're, you're you're calling for a 42 millimeter screw and they say well we only got 50 and 20 which one do you want and so you know it's, it's kind of like you know you're, you're cutting down sawing down screw you know it's just all the, the the crazy stuff you have to do to make things work but that's very okay. true but that's very true i did several years of foreign aid work in, again in the south pacific and it, that's exactly it you, you you know your closest spare bit of equipment's five thousand miles away you know it's it's not happening what do you what do you do and and that's in fact, if you've done that work in Afghanistan, and I've done mine in Vanuatu, you actually, you know, you're not in the best circumstances, and you 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 make do, but you also get a different perspective on all of that, you know, um, first world stuff. And you go, well, I actually don't need all this knee replacements and stuff. Uh, in Vanuatu, um, they are yet to have a. a, a to do a knee arthroscopy. I almost did the first knee arthroscopy there some years ago, and the guy ran away, or well, you know, hobbled away because uh, he thought it was all black magic. Uh, so that no one has actually had a joint replacement in an entire country. Uh, and, uh, and their only pain relief is, you know, paracetamol and, and, and indomethacin. Uh, morphine doesn't really exist there that they can use readily. Uh, and that sort of stuff changes you as a surgeon, you know, and uh, in perspective. And, I, and, I, and I'm very thankful for that time that I've done that. As I'm, I don't see what Sean said about his time in Afghanistan. It changes you as a surgeon uh, because you see the other side. Yeah, I mean, and, and I like I went down to Lima, Peru, uh, down to Peru for a for a medical mission mission years ago, and it was the same thing. We were teaching these guys how to do knee arthroscopy because they'd never seen it before, and this was like you know, this is some almost twenty years ago. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's the the things we we've come accustomed to and we expect are very different in other parts of the world. You know, there's some places where the the incidence of back pain is really low because there's nothing you can do about it, so they don't <laughs> complain about it. It doesn't really exist. Well, the incidence of back pain goes down if you go low cut. Well, yeah, that's true too, of course. <laughs> yeah. And guess what? Those populations are tend to be, tending to be low carb. You know, at least at the at where they're eating their fresh local and seasonal. I keep coming back to it, but you know, uh, look, we could go on for hours, but I, I better go and do some work. 
Yeah, go do some real work, Gary. This this trying to save the world stuff isn't gonna isn't gonna pay the bill. So <laughs> it's fun, but it is fun. Yeah, Gary, uh, it's been it's been a pleasure having you on the show, and uh, you're welcome back anytime, obviously. But uh, um, definitely, if you want to share any of the places that people can find you, uh, do that, and I can put them in the show notes as well. Well, we've got two websites: one called nofructose.com, and the other one, which is really about the politics and the vested interests, um, and really about by the background of why I've been hammered for. for Telling people to avoid sugar is a thing called I support Gary.com. Uh, and um, Belinda's on Facebook as Belinda Fetke No Fructose. Uh, I'm on Twitter as No Fruct- or Fructose No. But you know, um, we're all just trying to make a difference. Um, and uh, it's, it's part of a, a growing community and it's good to be supporting each other. Yeah, I may I'm into that. I think I think it, the more we help each other, the better it's going to be. And I think, like I said, we're all a bunch of little mosquitoes. A lot more of us, and you know they can't swat us all. And you know I, I'm encourage people that 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 for whatever crazy reason to 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 do their part and participate. And and you know because I seriously worry for the future of my children and my children's children as to where we're going to be going, uh, not only from a nutritional standpoint but from other things. And I think you know if, if we don't make a difference now, you know they're the ones that are going to pay the price later. We have a grandson now, and I was seriously concerned when he came into the, the world but all you can do with your children and your grandchildren is armed with the information give them the knowledge give them a questioning mind and uh and support them and i think they'll be okay uh i'm not saying that for the rest of the world but i'm hoping my kids and my grandchildren will be and cook with them right <laughs> oh absolutely absolutely i'm not a great cook but i'll, I'll still cook with them all right, Gary. What do you got? What do you got on the OR schedule today? Just out of personal curiosity, just out of. I've got plenty on. But, uh, I'm still a generalist here, so I've got some of a hip replacement, knee replacement. I uh, have some complex hind foot surgery, um, and uh, also um, uh, hand surgery. So I enjoy being a jack of all trades. Nice. That's fun. Yeah, I think that's a great way to do it. All right, Gary. We'll let you get to it. Patients don't get mad at you. Thank you so much. Uh, like I said, can't wait to talk to you in person sometime, and, and maybe we'll get you back on here down the road as more things develop. Okay. Thanks, guys. Take care, Gary. Hey, folks. Thanks again for tuning in to the Human Performance Outliers podcast. Just a couple quick notes before you leave. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find us at hpopodcast at gmail.com that's hpopodcast at gmail.com we're both also on social media on twitter you can find me at zbitter that's at z-b-i-t-t-e-r and you can find sean at sbakermd that's at s-b-a-k-e-r-m-d we're both also on instagram where you can find me at Zach Bitter, that's at Z-A-C-H-B-I-T-T-E-R. And for Sean, it's at Sean Baker, 1967. That's at S-H-A-W-N-B-A-K-E-R, 1967. Thanks again for tuning in to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers Podcast.